Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Mr. Tom Crawford. Hello. How are we all doing today? Tommy boy, (laughs) please, for the love of God, tell me what you do or, yeah, what do you do professionally? What do you do professionally, Tom? Professionally? uh, Professionally, I am a mathematician. Uh, In short... I knew it. <laughs> I, this is why I was scared for because you're either going to be my nemesis or my best friend. I have failed algebra <laughs> one three times. Okay. My school skipped me on my, uh, by my senior year, I was three math credits short and they told me, they put me in uh-huh. alternative education class where all I had to do was show up. I sat on my phone. I watched walking dead. I did all of that. I did not <laughs> learn any math. So you got to help me here. Why math? Why math? Um, ooh, I get asked this a lot. I guess for me, it's always made sense, but I am super aware that it doesn't for a lot of people, right? So, so for, for me, like, I think it's just how my brain works. When I, when I see the world, I see patterns. And maths is all about looking for patterns in the world. Like, if you were trying to sum up maths in one sentence, it would be the search for patterns. So... For me, when I'm when I'm looking at uh, sports, even like I play a lot of sport, like I'm spotting patterns as well as enjoying what's happening. I'm also like seeing what's going on around me, and like my brain just processes things through patterns. And then, so when I'm doing a, when you know when I was doing a subject at school, which is maths, which is spotting patterns, it just made sense to me. Um, I think that is sort of my personal take on why I'm into maths. But I like I was trying to say like i'm very aware that not everyone has that uh sort of that way that their brain processes things so i actually did a few years ago now uh, i used to work uh for the bbc uh on a radio show in fact making uh radio and podcasts not unlike this show <laughs> and that was my job and one of the things we did was we covered uh science news stories so we would take uh, research that was happening uh, like being published that week and our job as journalists was to go out and to interview the uh, the author of the research the person the scientist doing that research uh, and make sure that it was explained in an understandable manner for a radio show right so not necessarily aimed at a specialist audience and one of the really interesting um, bits of research I got to cover which links back to your question is um, it was a study looking at how the way that people think was related to their taste in music. And the, the study, uh, it was like a proper, um, what would you call it? Like a neuroscience or psychology study uh, done at the university of Cambridge. And they um, had me basically take part. That was part of the, the fun. I said, can I do this study and, you know, find out how my brain works and you tell me what music I should like. And I did the whole um, like online, Uh, questionnaire which was all about um, trying to get some kind of idea about how you process information how your brain worked it's not unsurprisingly like like the superhero test you can take on facebook it tells you which marvel avenger you are because it always i mean it's not (laughs) i'm gonna be tom holland and i'm not gonna be tom holland it's not that different it all right i would like to think there's more science in it than than the facebook personality test but you know it was literally a set of questions it was like how much do you agree or disagree with these statements various and various things I try to and, look at, well, I try to look at like, why do people get a degree in what they're getting a degree in? Like, obviously it's because of their passion, but I always look at like, why does that person fit that perfectly? Like you being a mathematician compared to like me, I wanted to chase my degree in psychology and it was because of what you're saying with understanding how music is. Right. They're all influences that are sparked into your life at a young age. Usually whatever a kid's super interested in or been around usually affects to what they want to do when they grow up i mean my parents were in radio it kind of only figured i ended up picking up a podcast mike (laughs) yeah no no i completely agree and and my me doing this test told me exactly what i thought i already knew was that i my brain processed things uh it was called systemizing i believe was the the sort of uh scientific term or the the correct technical term Uh, i was a systemizer so that was when I spot things or when I see things I'm, I'm enjoying and like, like something is beautiful to me because I see patterns in it rather than perhaps it's aesthetic beauty and different things like that. So I process my brain worked according to uh, this definition of being a systemizer and which fitted with the fact that I'm into and enjoy maths. 
and then um so obviously that was one part of it which i guess hopefully backs up what i was saying about maths just makes sense to me because my brain works in that way and then um the fun part of the of the study was that then uh i asked the the guy who was running it to then like you know play me music i should like based on the, what he's told me about my brain type because the the idea of the study was that your tasting music was linked to your brain type the way you think uh, and so it, it was completely true apparently systemizers people who think that's very similar to how i do um enjoy sort of heavy metal music uh, and classical music which are quite sort of two ends of the spectrum but the idea being that both of them are super complicated super complex have lots of um like underlying Str patterns they're strategic them. musical pieces usually when something comes together it's not just like you're banging away at some things you're doing a yeah. slow beat or something usually like uh because i mean i'm i this is a long thing that people have been trying to figure out for a while through my podcast but i'm not going to say it, but my middle name is named after a famous composer and that's what i learned about mm -hmm. is when you're listening to classical pieces so i learned to study a lot of his works because i wanted to know oh this guy's as my middle name yeah. as his first name, I need to figure out how he does this. And to hear um, the types of, first of all, I played music too, and trying to come in on the right notes, trying to figure out how all the pieces work together. It's the way you're seeing it. You're basically saying what you're seeing is you're seeing it all as a loophole going into each other thing, where I would see a math problem two times six. My brain is trying to find the answer. You have already found the answer only because your brain just processes that information because it holds it at a higher importance than mine would mine holds mm -hmm. you know it's sunny outside why don't you look outside that's what my brain <laughs> is holding as a priority which i feel like we use these as like i, I guess uh we as teachers are kind of do at least when i was in school was hit it with a stick like keep that that attitude that looking out the window out of here and pay attention to the curriculum which is important it needs to be taught but i think there's a point probably around middle school we should redevise the educational system by at least asking the kids what do they want to learn because usually what that person mm -hmm. wants to learn is what's going to give them an a if a kid loves building cars likes cars Put them in yeah. an auto shop class, you know? I mean, if somebody would have put me in a nature discovery class or a photography class, I probably would have excelled pretty quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, like you say, that's because that's how your brain is processing the world around you and, and what sort of makes sense to you the most. Um, so, yeah, I guess um, for me, that was just always maths. And I think that's why I studied at university um did my phd in maths and now i teach maths it's just sort of all <laughs> and do and do maths like um to me it just it feels natural it fits with how i think it just makes sense to me um and how so, do you typically try and prove to a kid like me that math is going to be used in our everyday life besides the basic functions like i never knew when train a had to hit station b at 45 miles per hour if train c was coming from a <laughs> south wind direction of a nine mile an hour wind like pythagorean theorem i feel like just never hit my category um well i think a lot of the issue with that is that uh and this is not necessarily the fault of the teacher because they're you know teachers are I'm definitely on the side of teachers. They're overworked. They don't get very well paid. They've got so much to deal with. And I just think that their teachers generally are quite undervalued for the important job that they do. But um, a lot of the way that maths is taught is just not like putting it into context. So, so if your example of um, Pythagoras' theorem, so I completely agree. The theorem itself to do with triangles, like you're not going to encounter a triangle in your life where you need to know the length of that third side of a triangle. But if you rephrase the question in a problem of you're trying to navigate through, um, I don't know, let's say you're trying to navigate through a city in the US where they have the block system and you're looking for the shortest possible route, like that in itself is a math problem, which in some situations would require you to solve Pythagoras' theorem. So whilst they're not obvious applications, like, you know, I guess we would just now use like a, a maps app to tell us the shortest route, yeah. but like you, there's certainly an opportunity to put these things in more of a relevant context than they are. Um, one of my favorite uh, examples to give when people ask me about this is um, trigonometry. So do you remember um, sine, cos and don't, tan? Don't do this. I never took trig. <laughs> 
I got just to where they started putting lines or little numbers above the ones beside it, like to the fifth power, to the sixth power. I was like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Like you got to. I'm like, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. No. <laughs> well, no, tricks, tricks to do with triangles. Tricks very similar to Pythagoras. So anyway, it's we don't need you don't need to know exactly what it is. The point is it's to do with triangles. It's to do with measuring distance and measuring angles. Short and sweet. But like it's taught, it's taught as a set of rules where similar to like Pythagoras, it's like, here's a triangle. I want to know the length of this side and I know this angle. Like that's just, again, that's a very like abstract thing that you're never going to see. But if you actually present trigonometry, this problem of triangles and angles, if you present it in the whole like historical reason why it was created, it was because like um, people in the past, were, for example, trying to estimate the height of a mountain they could see in the distance. So there's a mountain in front of you. It's very, very difficult. I don't know if you've ever tried this to actually know how tall that is by just looking at it in the distance. You can make an estimate. Yeah, I usually just be like, that's 200 tricky. feet. They're like, that's a toddler. He's not 200 feet. I'm like, that's 200 feet, 200 feet. <laughs> <laughs> like, so like, it, it's not an easy thing anyway, right? It, it's depending on, you know, where you are, racing. But that in itself is actually just a problem in trigonometry. So again, we don't need to worry about what trigonometry is, but like if you teach, you teach this maths concept in let's try and solve the problem of you're standing in a field, you can see a mountain three miles in the distance and you want to try and have a rough idea how high it is because you're going to walk that way. Then suddenly that's a much more interesting and relevant problem. This versus... is when I figured out that I wanted to be an architect and I figured out math was involved and it kind of just shot out the window. Like I get lucky with my answers to things. Like I'll be able to be like, it's this. And then they'll be like, show the work. I'm like, I can't, I literally <laughs> can't show. I couldn't write it down how I just came with that answer. Like you cheated. I'm like, I didn't cheat. But like, I mean, I was friends with someone in my class that did cheat a lot and he would be like, you know how I got the answer. I flipped to the back of the book where they're at and I put it down. That's me showing my work. He literally wrote down, <laughs> I flipped to the back of the book and then pulled the answer. That's what he wrote as the show your work part. But for me, it was like, I could just see it. And I remember I wanted to do architecture and like got super into geometry or tried to at least, even though I barely yeah. understood it. it was one of the math classes I took only because of the fact is I would see it everywhere I went. Every sport mm -hmm. I played, yeah. soccer, it was all about angles. It was all about, I'm like, we're doing it without thinking it of this way. But some people think of it in this way. When they see the ball, yeah. they go, if I kick it at a 90 degree angle this way, or if I do 180, or if I do, you know, something where it's using angles and forms in a more of a math way, then if some random sport guy just comes up to it and kicks it and goes, bam, it's in. I'm like, okay, you didn't really think of that process the way that same person did it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I talk a lot, um, like I do lots of public lectures and one of the, to the topics I do is the, the maths of sport. And I give loads of examples from loads of different sports and people often say to me, so does that mean professional players are doing these calculations, these maths calculations in their heads? Like you just said, of course they're not. But, you know, it's, it's just interesting that you can... What I'm, when, I'm, when I'm using maths to, to sort of model and to try and describe what's happening in a sport, I'm not doing it in the sense of um, people playing this sport should study maths and therefore, you know, do all these calculations. It's not at all saying that. It's more saying that they're doing it naturally. But if we analyze it and we use maths to understand why they're doing what they're doing, then you can actually... Um, you can actually get slight benefits out of, out of that. So you're not, um, okay, let me think of a more specific example because that's not super clear. Um, well, so I talk about, right, you mentioned soccer. So I, I play a lot of soccer or football, as I would say. Um, and uh, I talk about taking a penalty kick. So, you know, the ball's 12 yards out, you've got your penalty, right? And you're trying to score your goal. Yeah. So that's actually a maths problem. You can ask, or you can put that in the context of a maths problem and say, where do I aim in the goal, given I have some error, right? I can't perfectly put the ball at this exact point that I, you know, want to. But I can, you know, based on my ability, there is some error of accuracy that I have with my shot. So then the question is, where should you aim in the goal to maximize your chance of scoring that penalty kick? So again, if you could put with perfect accuracy, 
you would put it right in the top corner. So it's really far away from the goalkeeper's reach. Now, the problem with that is you've got very little margin of error because if you ever so slightly go too high or too wide, then you miss the goal. So whilst it puts it as far away from the goalkeeper as possible, there's very little error in your shot. So then what you can then ask is you can turn that into a mass problem and say, okay, so where is the optimum position to put it? I want to be as far away from the goalkeeper as possible. I want to be as far away from the crossbar as possible and as far away from the post as possible. So if the goalkeeper wasn't there, you're going to put it right in the center of the goal. Because then no matter how, you know, you've got your biggest margin of error. But of course, the goalkeeper stands in the middle, let's say. So then that kind of removes the middle from the, you know, as an option, because you're not going to put it straight down the middle because the goalkeeper, if they don't move, just saves the shot. So that's actually a bad idea. So then you can figure out how far can a goalkeeper dive? So in, I think it's about half a second from the ball being kicked to the ball going into the net, you have half a second as a goalkeeper to dive and to react to that shot. Um, and this again, right, we're obviously, we're assuming some things you have to with, with modeling. We're assuming the goalkeeper doesn't move until the ball is kicked. So there's no cheating. He's not diving early, which technically is against the rules. So the goalkeeper only moves once the ball has been kicked. They've got half a second to dive. And what you can do is you can work out how far can a human being dive as a goalkeeper in half a second. And you get like this perfect, like semicircle um, shape. So I called it in our study, we call it the diving envelope, but it's basically how far a goalkeeper can reach in half a second. So you have the middle of the goal is covered by the goalkeeper, but then the top corners are open because in half a second, it's not possible for a goalkeeper to take two steps and then dive to the top corner, right? No, you just can't do that in half a second. So then it just becomes a mass problem of, I need to be as far away from the reach of the goalkeeper as far away from the crossbar and as far away from the post. And you can calculate that exact position in the goal. And it's like, I think it's like six feet, uh, maybe two feet in from the post and six feet above the ground. So if you go to a full size football net, soccer net, and you move two feet in from the post and six feet above the ground, that exact spot is the perfect place, according to the mathematical calculation, of where to aim your penalty kick to maximize your chance of scoring. That's an amazing now, way that you think of it like that. And the way I'm thinking of it is Babe Ruth in it, where I just hit the fucking thing until it goes into the goal. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. And I like, and so the, the, the interesting thing is when I play, I don't aim for this spot. So even though I can do this calculation and find out exactly where the maths tells you you should aim, I personally don't actually do it when I take a penalty. <laughs> I just look at like the fact is that I think the biggest problem in the industry when it comes to the education system is just the way we're trying to teach a lot of this stuff too. Like the way you were just trying to tell me was a better way of explaining it than a lot of my teachers have tried to do it where they're just going on and on and on. I get it under the fact is as a teacher, I think nobody really realizes the stress you guys are under with the fact that you have to teach a group of kids uh, for a semester and then they go on to the next teacher. So all that information gets wiped away. You have to restart with a whole nother group of kids. That's got to be tasking to do that for years and years and still keep enthusiasm. But I think it's also the way of explaining it. You bring it into that relatable terms of doing something for soccer or whatever sport somebody is interested in. It's going to help them understand it a lot easier. Like, before, I never yeah. used to know what the lines over the numbers were, all these types of things. But then after years and years of being out of school and then going back to it, I'm like, oh, I get it now. It's this. Oh, it's this. Sometimes it just needs a while to soak in yeah. or you need to be more attentive to the idea of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, um, you know, I probably didn't give the best example about, you know, guessing the height of mountains. But again, like it's those kind of ideas, right? Whatever. Um, particular area of maths you're trying to teach you do want to frame it in that kind of application or that perhaps not super relevant everyday life because not everyone plays soccer but like you said if you've got a group of students that do and then they're going to actually be more engaged by that right so rather than me saying today we're going to do some maths and do some geometry if you phrase it as today I'm going to teach you how to take the perfect penalty kick in soccer you're just immediately like 
going to get that extra interaction and hopefully that extra understanding and enthusiasm for it from the students and then that helps to you know if you're enthusiastic and want to learn about something i think you're much more likely to learn it what do you typically um, see um as a as one of the things we kind of need in the mathematics department like if you were going to pick some things that you would qualify like the importance of teaching it and also some of the stuff that's not really needed like we talked about pythagorean's theorem i feel like that's a certain job quality you're going to use that in not in everyday life you know like if i'm pulling a sandwich out of the fridge that might be okay like i need to calculate the price of that sandwich or something but when it comes to understanding um the basics of what we need to be teaching and also the stuff that might not need to be in there because i'm pretty sure my teacher just pulled out blocks a lot of time and he was like just count these and stick these together i'm like i don't feel like this is benefiting me um well let's see the the issue with with that is it depends on i suppose it depends on like what you're trying to teach well it's the same thing um, like if you learned reading right um reading yeah. and writing cursive was taken out because we just like well fuck it we don't need that okay that's true for basics but there are a lot of people that want to do creative writing want to do um yeah. you know it's better doing it in cursive because it looks more professional it's more aesthetic appeal what would be maths like there's some things about science you don't really need to learn a whole lot when it comes down to all the elemental or periodic table of elements but you still need to know at least some of the basics like that's still an yeah. a, a side class so what would in math would be something because i feel like they drew the line at calculus that we didn't need but i was like isn't there anything else yeah um <laughs> so again i think the the obvious oh i say the obvious the the most perhaps useful context to teach maths then would be to do with finances perhaps in terms of things that's like relevant to almost everybody's life right you need to be able to understand your finances in you know can i pay my bills this month am i able to like am i getting a good interest rate on my savings account is this a good loan for me to take out my mortgage whatever it is you need to be able to understand uh, how finance works and a lot of that comes down to like percentages for example and understanding how percentages work what they mean um, interest rates so i think something like that isn't necessarily taught we're kind of taught percentages we're taught about um you know decimals and things but not in the context of like you know here's like a, a mathematical finance class in some sense of like here's how you understand what your bank is going on about when they say this is the the monthly apr you have to pay on this bill here's how to write a check that's all i want <laughs> <laughs> but like i think i think something like that is like super 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 useful which isn't really taught in that context it's just kind of you just kind of pick it up by i guess experience almost yeah um so something like that would be super super helpful um i think if you're and this is what i meant by it depends what you're trying to teach because if you're just trying to prepare people to be able to be uh like numerically literate so like you said about reading to be able to read numbers right to like be basic functions. numerically literate yeah then then i think looking at like finance stuff is a really really good and important sort of starting point um for that kind of thing but then if it's more just about um teaching people the absolute basics of maths then it wouldn't be too different to what we currently do because the way maths is structured as a subject is everything that you learn that's new builds on the previous level it's literally like layering bricks you can't like just suddenly jump in at one particular level like you can't, you know, you have to learn numbers before you can then do arithmetic and arithmetic before you can, right? Algebra makes no sense if you don't know how to multiply and divide. And then uh, calculus makes no sense if you don't understand algebra and the idea of a variable X and Y. If you haven't done some kind of algebra, some kind of equations, you don't make sense of calculus. So like, everything else builds on everything before it. Um, I just look at the fact we had number so lines trying and trying to just to learn just... like well, the, the, I looked at how we try and trace scatter plots and number lines on a thing. And I'm like, I don't know where that one would really come in handy with anything with the basics. I mean, I get the whole math, the division, yeah. all that stuff. That is definitely essential. Like if you're going out, you can't just be like, 
oh, buy a $10 sandwich for five bucks. That's not going to happen. That's not how the world works. You need to know how to calculate that. But at the same yeah. time, like, I don't know how many times I was sitting in class getting in trouble for trying to trace a scatter plot or draw a number line. I'm like, but when am I going to need this right now? Like, I don't feel like at any point I'm tipping at a TGI Fridays, I'm going to be drawing a number line and asking the girl. <laughs> Actually, I might ask the girl to find my range or medium. I don't know. <laughs> um, fair point. I guess the the idea behind scatter plots, for example, though, um, I see where you're coming from. But then I guess I would counter that with, if you do anything at all to do with data, then you have to be able to interpret a scatter plot. So okay, not everybody in their life is going to encounter data and need to understand data points, but a lot of people are. So even if you're not going to go on and do any maths, if you're going to go on and want to in most jobs, you are going to have to interpret data points, I think, which, which could be in like, and it might not feel like you're interpreting data points. So I don't know if you're like, um, let's say you're a manager responsible of several people, let's just say in a sandwich shop and you can like the kind of data you're collecting, for example, might be like, um, perhaps how late each of your employees are averaged every day per year, every day over the year. Right, and if you if you were able to collect that data, then you could actually do a simple math analysis, like you just said. You could calculate the median amount of time, the mean amount of time each employee was late, and that would give you a feel, perhaps, for their performance in terms of you know, do they turn up for work on time? So, whilst if you, if you didn't approach that mathematically, then you might just remember, like when it I don't know when it came around to like bonus or performance based review or something and you're deciding do I give a bonus to, to which employees then you might you know maybe last week one of your employees was late day on mind and so you probably wouldn't give them the bonus but if you happened to have access to all of that data and you actually calculated on average how late was everybody maybe the person who was late every day last week was never late for any other day of the year or was only very rarely late but you perhaps wouldn't necessarily see that unless you had access to all of the data and unless you were able to do some kind of simple like analysis or some simple maths behind it. So of course I'm not saying, and I, I doubt any manager in any sandwich shop ever has done this, but like that's the kind of like idealized situation where you might use these things, but you would never think to use them if you didn't have those tools accessible to you. Yeah, kind of like an extra hand, I would say. I mean, if you have a business owner that's thinking that far ahead, or at least in those different types of terms, you might have a better stance of maybe flourishing as a business compared to someone that's not yeah. thinking in those layman terms. Exactly, exactly. So, so it's kind of perhaps it's more, it's not necessarily that um, you will, that as an average person, you will encounter scatter plots. It's perhaps more that if you know how to deal with them, if you understand them, you know and you how are to properly solve that taught, problem when it arises. Yeah. If All you're right. properly taught about their benefits, then it might be in your mind as, oh, this would be useful to me in this situation. And, you know, so like, like you were saying, that might help you to flourish as a business owner, for example. Is it ever occur to you just with the fact that with technology coming out at such rapid rates of new things, different apps and stuff that, that a lot of math is kind of getting deleted out of the, um, the, the topic or discussion a little bit like calculators are so easy that it seems like it's not as mandatory. I mean, back in the day trying to calculate yeah. tip was a motherfucker, but now it's like, yeah. I can just do it <laughs> on my phone. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Um, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing though, because it's, it's just different skills. Like, so, so for example, um, in, in the UK, we use, or we still do actually, we learn the 12, up to the 12 times tables at school, right? So when you're learning your times tables, for whatever reason, you learn up until the 12 times table. 144. And exactly. 12 twelves. And that's because <laughs> the, the former, um, the currency in the UK used to be, I think it was like 12 shillings was one pound. So in your everyday life, you would be encountering multiples of 12 because when you're trying to pay for things, you would need to be able to multiply and divide by 12. So that was why we used to teach that. And then, you know, and then um, now it's like no longer relevant. So I, I think people now just learn up to the 10 times table because you need to be able to multiply and divide by 10. Even, even in the US where you use weird 
systems, even your money is still at least in tens. Um, even though you probably need to know like 16s and other things for like ounces and pounds and stuff. I don't actually know the <laughs> those measurements, I'll be honest. Even become a, like a math teacher, what do you typically try and at least show or try and bring to people? Is it just all about understanding the idea, making it relatable in experiences? I feel like with knowledge and all this education that we have, the hardest thing is trying to explain it in a way someone doesn't understand it. Like you trying to explain it before, it was easier because you were relating it to things that I think a lot of people like I, I see that with all yeah. these kids that are becoming teachers now. I mean, so many people my age, um, your age, you know, they're all really taking a shot. And when they go and get their degrees, when they go into the education field, they're actually making it relatable to that person. I felt like for so long, I was a kid, I had teachers that were in their 60s, trying to teach me math. Like back in my day, you know, bread was uh, 20 cents. And then yeah. this, and, <laughs> and it's like, now we're dealing with things like, hey, did you know a boba tea is 349 minus you have $5 in your wallet, how much are you going to have left over? It makes it so much more relatable to kids to understand now. And I think that's important, especially with doctors and uh, teachers. They're all from a newer generation than the older one before it, obviously. Um, my grandparents' age, uh, that was uh, every time I went to the hospital as a kid, it was always somebody in their 50s or 60s. Now I'm still walking in there, there's kids my age in there. I'm like, holy crap, I don't know if yeah. I trust you to take care of me, but I think it's a new way of it too, a new era that we're kind of ushering into. Yeah, so I think you're, you're always going to get that, um, or you would like to think, there's always going to be that, the constant sort of generations of teachers, and, you know, it's going to be the old ones and the young ones. That'll be the same. Um, but, I, but I see what you mean. Perhaps it's just that the more recent, like it, I, I think what you're trying to say, perhaps, or at least the way I'm hearing it, is that you find it easier to be taught by somebody who's closer to your age because they can make it more relevant and relatable to you I think that's what it is. It's like if you read a book from like 1940 or something, it's going to have, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you watch, um, let's take Family Guy, for instance. It's a lot yeah. of pop culture references that are popular now that you've grown up with. Yeah. You're going to like that more than your parents who might have grown up on The Simpsons because a lot of that hit to where their time period yeah. was. It was more understandable. That's what I think it is teaching it's like mm -hmm. you you find someone that is able to maybe not the same age as you maybe 10 15 years older but they'll still have the same knowledge or kind of understanding of what you've kind of been influenced by it's like it goes back to the beginning of our discussion about what music you're interested in or all these types of things is because mm -hmm. of your influences of how you grew up yeah no no, no definitely um like like my students definitely i think enjoy being taught by me because they they find me more relatable because yeah. like you say, we're, we're similar in age. Um, but you got then, a punk rock look too. That's going to, any teacher that, you know, looks like you <laughs> is teaching me something, I'm paying attention. <laughs> I mean, it could go both ways, right? I'm sure there are some people who would hate to be taught by. My one teacher uh, had pants but, that were so buttoned up to his nipples, basically. <laughs> like I was like, sir, you're not wearing, you're wearing pants and as a, as pants and a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, my chemistry teacher was, that was the one for me. Yeah. With the, uh, the, what was it? Pants as high as his nipples. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I think there's, but then the, the thing I did want to come back to, right. So whilst, um, being taught by somebody's closer to your age is, is certainly, um, helpful in terms of perhaps making things more relatable because they're able to come up with examples that you're both there's maybe there's some overlap between the two of you um that doesn't necessarily though i think you've got to be careful because it doesn't necessarily mean that the older teachers can't also do that yeah but they just have to kind of do it in a different way so perhaps rather than make they can still make things relatable but then they're just not going to make them like pop culture references like you say right so rather than um, so, so let's take, you gave an example of like buying, um, what do you just call it? Boba tea or bubble. I would call it bubble tea. Is that bubble what you tea. Same thing? Is it? Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't need it and I don't drink it. I just know it's popular down here. I see. Yeah. Some... yeah. No, but like, right. So, so whilst that, so like, so whilst that example might resonate with like, you know, teenagers today, let's say vegans, but like, <laughs> but then, um, you could, you could still make something relatable by doing the same idea, but instead of talking about a specific item, just talking about like tipping on a restaurant bill, 
right? So like there's, there's a, there's, it's like, you don't need to make it a super current, super like up to date reference. That's going to like, you know, get with it, it with the teens. The ball kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, so, you know, I don't think it rules out older teachers, but like, like you were saying, you know, you're being taught by some 60 year old, 60 something teacher. They don't need to say in my day, bread was 20 cents, blah, blah, blah. Like that's just a terrible way of teaching. They could then right, we're not expecting them to like start talking about bubble tea, but they could make, you know, a reference of maybe they could actually make a reference to the past that was interesting in the sense of, you know, maybe you would say something like we, when I used to go to restaurants, we would tip 10% and now uh, everyone tips 20%. Like, Here's here's a bill of eight dollars. What's the difference between if I was tipping with my ten percent in the past and you're tipping today with your twenty percent? And you ask that question. So you kind of like you're making it relevant by presenting it in the context of tipping in general, but you don't need to like, you know, be hitting all of the like buzzwords kind of, you know, of the time. You just need to get in the ballpark at least to where someone can basically yeah. understand it. Don't make it so unrelatable. The information soaks in better when we're able to relate to it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what have you seen difficulties as doing, trying to do your job or be able to teach kids and be relatable with the fact of the pandemic going on where everything kind of shut down? I mean, all the teachings, mm -hmm. all these teachers that I knew were all complaining about how their, their, their semester's over. They got to wait till the kids next year. They don't know when they can open back up. And then we started figuring out Zoom meetings for teachings. Yeah. Um, which is kind of difficult because some person can just mute their photo and then they could be doing whatever they want in the background. They're not actually getting the information in there. What kind of, uh, like, I guess, how has this kind of changed since this all started for you? Um, it's not been that drastic of a change. I've been quite fortunate. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really fortunate in the, um, at the university where I'm teaching, like, all of the students are basically like the smartest kids in the UK slash possibly the world. So they're all incredibly smart, incredibly hardworking. And you don't ever like very, very rarely do I have to like chase them up for not doing their work. Right. They're all, they all want to learn. They all like, if anything, want to learn more. But and, the like, lack of communication time. though, the aspect is like, see me and you are talking like this. This is fun. Yeah. But we would have a different feel if we were in the classroom together and you were teaching me as a student, I would have a more of a grasp of it. Like, you know, people go to the library yeah. to study because it has that environment feel to them. Yeah, no. So that, so, so I think for me, I was going to say it hasn't necessarily been an issue of like them not paying attention or not, you know, like you say, turning off their video and playing on their phones or whatever. So I've never had to, I've not had to worry about that, but then you're definitely right in that it does feel harder to engage um because normally again i'm super fortunate like the teaching that i normally do is me with two students sat around a desk sat around a table and we're going through maths problems together and and it's very much a discussion so it's in the sense of they have answered some questions turned up with their solutions i do the questions myself turn up with my solutions but a lot of what we're doing doesn't have an obvious answer so it is actually quite sort of whilst maths, you know, it's right or it's wrong. There are lots of different ways to answer a particular problem, let's say. So we're actually having a full on discussion where everybody is engaged, where I might start off and say, oh, I thought about this question in this way. How did you think about it, student A? And then student A will then say, oh, I thought about it in this way, perhaps, and then talk and explain their thought process. Um, and, you know, and then the three of us would have an actual like debate about that topic and you just can't do that or i haven't yet found an actual like as engaging way to do that over video it's like you can still have an engaging conversation sure and i can still talk through my ideas and i actually have like a, a whiteboard you know where i write and like you know have it i stand up and have it like next to me on the screen so the students can still see what i'm writing and, and i miss the overhead days man those were the days when you had the overhead <laughs> Blinding overhead light. projectors are great yeah <laughs> freaking smart boards now always piss i remember oh, no, this, right when they implemented those things i was like i don't know how to do this with the touching and this and that and it's like i like the overhead <laughs> or that light used to blind you while you worked on it but yeah <laughs> i am um, <laughs> my office used to have a whiteboard and I actually managed to get the university to replace it with a blackboard. 
because I was like, maths is better done on a blackboard. Like I like chalk, so. dude. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, I like chalk. Like, I, I, I agree. So I don't. I unfortunately don't have a, a blackboard at home. So I have to make do with the whiteboard. What do you but, typically see like with the COVID thing going on like in the future? Do you think it's going to change or it's going to end up going back to the same? I know we're kind of opening back up and it seems like people are totally forgetting about what's going on, even though we got these new precautions now. But it's like, yeah, in, in the States, like schools are talking about, oh, we're going to be ready after summer. We're going to be back. It's, it's going to be fine. We're not have to worry about social distancing and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know. School is already so complicated as it is. And I feel like it, it takes a lot to get that classroom feel like it's time to learn and start getting into something yeah. like a session. And I feel like with people having that on their mind, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Hello. Oh, sorry. I think. Um, yeah. So again, we're not doing lectures. I don't think for maybe not even at the end, until the end of the year. That's so, too freaking long, man. Yeah, so well, so we're doing, um, so at the moment lectures are all online. So, so the lecturers uh, are giving the lecture, but it's obviously you tune in, watch the video and do it online. So that's what's been happening for the last few weeks. And then now lectures have just finished and we've got two or three weeks uh, and then all the students have got exams. So at the moment, it's all about like uh, revision sessions and preparing for these exams. Uh, and then term next year would start back in October. Um, but I believe the current plan is to not have lectures because the argument is that social distancing, at least at my university, they're still not planning to, sorry, they're still planning to implement social distancing wherever possible. And having 300 people in a lecture room that seats 350 say like it's just not going to be possible so they wouldn't be able to fit everybody in a lecture room you know given the number of students and everything so they're going to continue to do lectures online but then the the sort of classes where the students do most of their learning which are the ones i teach where it's me and two students the plan is to actually do that but just to host them in larger rooms so rather than being in my reasonably small office you will just book a larger room on the university campus and just i guess have a larger table or you know where you would have still hopefully the three of us sat around the table but all are at least two meters apart so this is actually is pretty good now that i start thinking about it because if the fact is if you're going from a small room with two students to a bigger room with maybe an added student or say just to fit you know the proper use of the room you're obviously going to get more attention and more on-hand learning with more of the students instead of doing classrooms of 50 or 60 or 100 kids you're doing classes yeah. of like 10. I think that's yeah. way better hands-on learning. So that actually might stop people from slipping through the cracks like myself. Yeah, no, I, I think for, for, for like, um, you know, I was talking about my specific situation where we'll, we will still have the same numbers because we only ever had two students per teacher. So um, that's just the way that the, the teaching works. But yeah, in schools in general, I think you're completely right in that, um, right, if, if before you had a room that could fit 30 students, now it can only fit, say, 10. Um, but then the issue is going to be how is that going to um, work given that you know suppose there's still a fixed number of hours in the day you can only have a fixed number of classes so if is that going to mean that students come in in shifts like you only go in for half a day because you know maybe one half of the class does the morning and then the other half does the afternoon and the teacher has to teach the same thing twice let's say because otherwise there's not going to be um, because the, the 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 idea of saying I can only teach ten at a time is great if you have more teachers and therefore can do like three simultaneous classes, right? If you've gone from a class of thirty to a class of ten, if you suddenly had an extra two teachers, that's perfect because you just do three classes of ten, everyone gets more attention. But given that we're probably not going to see any increase, probably less teachers, in fact, if some people are ill, for example different things or some people are uh, self-isolating because of symptoms it seems like a, it, this opened up a new window for people to just to stay home and get an entrepreneur job or do a self-service business now i mean it's amazing yeah. that people have the time free time now to be able to explore that side of them but i feel like a lot of people are going to be deathly afraid of going back into public i know so many people yeah. that are still collecting unemployment because they're afraid to go back to their job over the fact of they have a family member that has um you know autoimmune disease or something that can cause yeah. them to get sick easier so it's like 
man, it's really rough to tell. Like, it feels like when people are talking about this new normal, I'm looking at it like it's going to go back to normal, but there's going to be people that are just going to be scared. And I'm like, we got to have that awkward feeling of being in a classroom with 30 something kids and trying to sit there and learn, hoping you don't fart when you're trying to, you know, learn something about history or something like all those weird experiences were fun. I just, I see my little nephew where his whole year was gone and he basically got off like the past couple of months since this whole thing's shut down down here. And I'm like, man, you're missing so much class. And he's like, it's awesome. I'm like, I had a 16 day snow day when I was a kid. 16 days of school gone. So that was rare. It was the first time in like probably four years that something like that had happened. When I got back, I didn't know shit. I lost my locker combination. The one I've had for two years, I couldn't remember that. I couldn't remember. I just felt out of place. I'm like, dude, you just got off for the past five months. You got summer now. When you're going back to school, how do you think it's going to be? You're going to be behind by so much. He's like, oh, I don't want, oh, that's the future me to worry about. I'm like, that future you is going to be <laughs> fucked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, like there's, like you said, there's, there's the, the sort of the, the advantage of the, of having this extra time is if you use it well, then you can actually sort of experience other things, right? Like you said, you know, you have more time to explore entrepreneurial side of things or even if you're a younger kid you just have more time to generally like be outside or hang out with your friends or play video games whatever it is you're into um but then at the same time obviously that comes at the cost of you you are going to like there's just going to be certain parts of your school curriculum you're just never going to learn um but you know i guess not everything on the school curriculum is super important. So <laughs> if, if we prioritize which bits that we concentrate on teaching, Look, that might they, even come back to what we were talking about earlier, took, right? If we... They took out recess, okay? So I already know that there's stuff we can cut. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I guess, yeah, but maybe that's like, comes back to what we were talking about before about um, like what are the most important things. And that might be a way that in future we might, you know, for the next few years even, that might be what you have to do in your school curriculum. If you're not able to have full-size classes and have the same number of contact hours with your teacher, it then becomes a question of, okay, I've only got 60% of the hours I previously had to teach these students. So do we just focus on like the important stuff and what is that important stuff? And then that's a whole question of, you know, what, what should and shouldn't be kept in the curriculum. Yeah. I have to end this on one question, Tom. Are you ready for it? Go on. How do you think the pyramids were built? <laughs> the pyramids were built by the ancient Egyptians using maths um, and very clever bits of engineering. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's a good answer. I mean, I'm a mathematician. I'm a mathematician. I've got I'm just trying logically... to figure out how the hell we did it. That's all. I can't do that. And that means an Egyptian smarter than me back in the day before we even knew how to shit with paper. So I'm pretty... <laughs> i don't think that we didn't know it i think it's just no one had thought of it yet yeah, we use papyrus one of those. we use that thin yeah. paper which is terrible you want the bulk paper to cover up more of the spread <laughs> if i can think of that please explain to me how an egyptian can build a pyramid with these perfectly big blocks how would they even lift it johnny how well, they, they had apparently, again, I, I'm not an expert on the history, but they had various like clever mechanisms using um, like you can roll it over like logs or you can use stones. There are surprisingly clever ways to do it. They, they wouldn't have lifted it. It would have been dragged or rolled using some kind of roller mechanism. Because if you just take, if you just go outside now and just get a load of sticks or a load of logs, and put them in a line, you can like push a very heavy weight along those logs. It just rolls across them. Do you ever wish right. you could just go back in time with some of the smarts that you have and just, you know, live there and just revolutionize the whole place? <laughs> be so awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> I would love to go back just, in time to like the caveman days and be like, hey, dummies, this is fire. Pull out like an axe yeah. cannon and a lighter. <laughs> <laughs> or even what you just said, right? Just turn up with toilet paper. Be like, yeah. go back to ancient Egypt. Be like, guys, revolutionary idea right here i am king. <laughs> yeah. stop wrapping your mummies with that and start yeah. wiping your ass with that that's how we do exactly. it. exactly changing yeah. the world tom one cushy <laughs> at a time uh, all right tom but i appreciate you coming out and doing the podcast man is there anything you want to promote your page anything um well something we um we didn't mention too much is 
Um, alongside my main job of teaching, being a mathematician, I do lots of uh, public engagement, lots of stuff, uh, which actually linked into a lot of what we talked about, about trying to get more people to engage with maths, not be scared of maths. See maths as, can be just as fun as anything else. So because I happen to love it so much, I'm trying my best to present maths in a way to let other people not hate it. I'm not expecting them to love it. I'm just expecting them to hopefully no longer hate it or no longer be scared of it even. Um, and so I do lots of stuff, lots of interesting things about trying to make stuff relevant, trying to make stuff funny, trying to make stuff entertaining. Um, and that's all um, on my website, tomrocksmaths.com. And then all my social media uh, profiles are just at tomrocksmaths. Uh, so that's like the other branch of what I do alongside my teaching. It's all about uh, let's try and have a bit more fun with maths because it's, it's far too serious in short. You said it yourself, right? You, you picture these old men in tweed jackets with tightly buttoned trousers um, teaching like, it. And it's I like just not, the tweed jackets. not particularly appealing. The tweed jackets are okay. I like the ones with the elbow patches. but like <laughs> The typical, yeah. The professors. But I feel like, yeah, you, you definitely open it up a little bit more to me, at least understanding it a little bit more. I, before, I would have been like, yeah, it's not really needed. But I think understanding how it kind of all balances into the factors of life, and especially discovering that on my own, like just growing up and realizing bills and all these things. Um, yeah, there's an important factor to it there that I think needs to be stressed, but I also think it needs to be refocused a little bit too on what we could be learning. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I think, I'm, I think we're, we're in agreement. It's, it's important. I'm not saying it's the most important thing in the world by any stretch. I just happen to enjoy it. It can but be it, fun. It is important. Is it can be saying. helpful. It can, it be, can fun. be fun. Yeah. And we should focus more on that. We want to focus more on making it relevant, making it people see the use of it. Like you said. And just having more fun with it. I just don't think we have enough fun with maths. Like some of the subjects you do, you know, like, like, I don't know, you do like cool experiments in lots of your science subjects, for example, or like, I don't know, you learn about like interesting, let's say battles or civilizations in history. And that's kind of how it becomes a bit more fun and people get involved. But like, I feel like the way we teach maths doesn't really have that sort of exciting element to it. So Oof, I, I'm trying my best to add that. I think maybe try something like take people to go see how a building gets made, like to draw the floor plans out for a building. Yeah. Architecture absolutely. is probably the easiest example to be able to help people learn math. Cause I mean, that's the, one of the funnest ones. Imagine you're creating something from nothing. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. So let's just teach geometry, right? If I was in charge, instead of teaching geometry and shapes, let's just teach it by saying, right, we're going to build a building. We're going to design a house. Let's do it. Like, you know, I think that it would be a much better way to literally teach people about it's geometry and shapes and triangles. Be Guardians of the galaxy. Y'all are going to be seeing some weird ass shit right now. Like <laughs> you start building random buildings. Why did you build that there? I just wanted a statue of a horse and that's what we got. <laughs> well, Tom, that was perfect, man. I'll make sure to link up the profiles in the description. And thank you so much for listening to this episode of out of the blank podcast and stay tuned for our next episode.